Okay, assalamu alaikum and welcome everyone to this session on Pakistan and 5G, the way forward. It is my honor and pleasure to have a number of esteemed uh, panelists on board for this session. We do have uh, people joining in from Pakistan, but I'm also particularly pleased to have uh, guests and panelists from outside of Pakistan as well. I'm going to just dive right, uh, sorry, right into the introductions of the panelists first. So let me first of all introduce our very first panelist, Mr. Scott Meinham. Scott is an international regulatory and strategy lawyer slash economist in the communication sector and has been involved in advising investors, operators, governments, and regulators in Australia, Asia, the Pacific, and Africa for over 30 years. Thank you very much, Scott, for joining us. I know you're sitting in Australia at the moment, so it's a little ahead of us. So thank you for doing this. Okay. okay, next we have uh, Louis uh, Zogby. Uh, Louis works as a senior spectrum policy manager at the GSMA. For those of you who do not know, GSMA is a, is a world association of operators from all over the world. And he focuses on the global and regional advancement of spectrum issues such as licensing, roadmaps, pricing, sharing, and 5G international advocacy. Thank you, Lewis, for joining. I know you're sitting in UK right now, and I can still see that it's still dark outside and very early in the morning for you. So really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. OK. Next, we have uh, our very own uh, international consultant sitting in Pakistan, Mr. Pervez Iftikhar. Pervez is, uh, is an international consultant in ICT policy and regulation for various developing economies. He works with many global bodies like ITU, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, just to name a few. He's also a member of Prime Minister's Task Force on ICT. Thank you, Parvesa, for joining the session. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, we do have two other panelists on board as well. Uh, these are two uh, individuals from the government organizations. They would be joining us shortly. I do see perhaps one of them joining us, uh, and that's Mr. Amir Shahzad. So I'm just going to delve uh, into his introduction first. Assalamu alaikum, Amir Sahib. Thank you for joining the session. Well, Amir Sahib is... Sorry. Uh, sorry, I got late because there was some connectivity issue over here with the Zoom link. No, that's perfectly fine. I mean, uh, we were all living in this virtual world and the technical glitches happens all over. So it's fine. <laughs> so Mr. Amir Shadad is DG Licensing in Pakistan Telecommunications Authority. That's the regulator here in Pakistan. He is extensively involved in provisioning of high quality voice and data services in Pakistan. Then another gentleman who will be joining us hopefully uh, shortly because is presently tied up at a meeting at the ministry is going to be Mr. Omar Malik. I'll do his introduction as well because then he can join in and just delve uh, you know, right deeper into the, straight into the discussions that we would be having. So Omar Malik is a member telecom in the Ministry of IT and Telecom. Omar has 20 years of diversified experience working for tier one technology companies, specifically outside of Pakistan. Omar is also a member of Prime Minister's Task Force on ICT and he's also part of the Federal Committee on National Policy Matters. So these are the esteemed panelists that we have uh, today with us, both nationally and internationally. Thank you, gentlemen, for doing this. Um, today, as I mentioned, we will be talking about the possibility of 5G in Pakistan and what is required to get towards this latest next generation of mobile communication services uh, that's happening around the world as well. So Pakistan also now needs to start looking in that direction and see what is it that's required and needed to get to the 5G era because Pakistan was already quite late in introducing 3G and 4G as compared to the rest of the countries in the world. So it's very, very imperative and important that we get there as soon as possible. So, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. So the first question I'm going to pose to you, Scott, and that is that um, uh, earlier last year, uh, you, got, you did a study uh, along with the World Bank on a gap analysis, and this is specifically from a spectrum point of view as well, on what are the gaps uh, that are there from a spectrum point of view in Pakistan, and what are the things that are needed in order to fix those gaps so that we can move towards 5G. It was a very extensive report that you guys did. I've also had a chance to look at it as well, and there were some really interesting um, findings and recommendations that were coming from your side. So I would like you to first, as a starting point, shed some light on that report and what were the findings from it. Scott, over to you. 
Sure. Look, firstly, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk to everyone today. Um, yeah, let me talk a little bit about and um, about the study that we did. I was engaged by the World Bank with a team, including a number of um, people inside the World Bank. Um, Pavez is involved and, and a whole team from South Korea looking at some of the other aspects, which we may not get to today about, around uh, the applications and things like that. But the principal focus of the report was about looking at whether Pakistan is ready for 5G and all of the readiness issues. I think the first thing, you know, and we, we are, I hope today is going to be really interactive. I think the first thing I really want to say is, is that Pakistan uh, has some challenges about being ready because the number one problem is it doesn't have enough spectrum. And, you know, when I say spectrum, I mean mobile spectrum or what we call in the industry IMT spectrum, that spectrum that is used for mobile telecommunications. Now, every country actually has exactly the same amount of spectrum. It's a question of how Pakistan has made it available, not made it available. And, and I think the key thing I wanted to just highlight to, to a broader audience on this session is that one of the Australian operators has as much spectrum allocated to it as all of the industry does in Pakistan, right? So when you hear of, uh, you know, what's happening in other countries and you hear this, whether it's a broadband speeds or the ability to invest in things like 4G and 5G, you've got to understand that those operators have the ability to do that because they have the platform on spectrum. And, you know, at the moment, what, you, what I would say on the spectrum question is that Pakistan has uh, artificially restricted the amount of spectrum, maybe because it was seeking higher prices, some artificial scarcity, uh, maybe not appreciating that the newer technologies, the moment you move from 2G to 3G to 4G to 5G, you really need for 5G uh, larger contiguous blocks. And I think anyone who's interacted with me in Pakistan would have heard me say that probably a hundred or a thousand times. It really does like bigger blocks of spectrum um, to make it really, to, to get the, the maximum efficiencies um, uh, to, to drive the investment and to actually get the speeds that I know that, you know, Pakistanis, particularly young Pakistanis, are very keen to get. You know, what I also want to say, too, is that there are a number of other elements on readiness. And, you know, I, your question was on spectrum, but clearly there's a need to think about devices. There's a need to think about the transmission networks to support all of these types of services. But, you know, I think the key thing, the missing ingredient is spectrum. And, um, you know, um, I could make two jokes. One about if you want to make a good biryani, you need to have certain spices. Without those spices, you know, spectrum, you're not going to be able to make a good biryani. And, you know, if we look at cricket, which I'm a big fan of, um, clearly you need to have some good fast bowlers. And, uh, and without that, you're not going to win test matches. So I think that's, you know, part of the game here that, you know, if Pakistan is serious about embracing the digital economy, and I think it should be um, because I think if anything, and I've written papers for the ITU over this period, um, COVID has meant that there's an acceleration of things that could go online, have gone online. And that includes both in emerging and developed country markets. So with that in mind, if you want to participate in that digital economy, um, then you have to make those steps. And that means making more spectrum available um, the price per megahertz will have to drop as part of that process because you're going to introduce more spectrum into the market. But the economic value of that, of bringing that forward, is going to be a beneficial to the country. So my last comment, I'm not sure how long I had, but just to sort of flag, you have the spectrum. 700 megahertz is available. 2.3 is completely available tomorrow. 2.6 will be available if you can resolve a very long-standing court case. You have one of the premier uh, pioneer bands for 5G in 3.5 gigahertz, which is also at least a, a significant chunk is available today. So there's no really no excuse. It's a question of will. It's a question of good policy supporting that. So let me leave my comments there because uh, my other esteemed panelists will probably also have some comments on this as well. But um, you know they're the key uh, elements. Without the spectrum, without good mobile spectrum, we're, we're having a, a very theoretical discussion. Thank you, Scott, for that. And you're absolutely right that uh, 
even though the, spect uh, the spectrum is the bloodline of the network and everything needs to be built on top of that, but of course the whole ecosystem also needs to be looked at, again, from a uh, you know, device's point of view, from transmission point of view as well. But right now, we, we, uh, because since I specifically asked about the spectrum, so we're going to stay on focused on that one, and then we'll move to the next one later in the later in the hour. So Amish is asking, I'm going to move to you towards you, and I just want you to now, because Scott did this whole analysis, and he's also saying that there are a number of challenges that we have here in Pakistan, specifically from a spectrum policy point of view as well. So what is your take on that, and how? Is the government now, you know, the gaps that were identified in the study from the World Bank, how is the government tackling that and how are you going to take that forward? Thank you very much. First of all, uh, I must appreciate that you have given me time over here to present the perspective from the uh, regulator point of view. Basically, as everyone knows that uh, it is spectrum is provided in Pakistan through an auction process and purely under the policy directives of the government of Pakistan. Government of Pakistan may decide any mechanism to provide the spectrum to the operators. Now, as far as spectrum availability is concerned, Mr. Scott has rightly pointed out that sufficient spectrum is available in the Pakistan, which can be provided to the operator or can be offered to the operator. But if we see the past history, whenever the spectrum was offered to the operators, most of the time, it is only one odd operator which came up and got the required spectrum, whatever he was required for his business. So there was not a single instance where spectrum which was offered to the operators and there's a tough bidding on that and price gone too high, mostly it went on the base prices. No determination of the base price is always undertaken with the help of the international consultants who determine the base price, seeing the ARPU, seeing the population, seeing the demand over here, seeing the growth in the industry. There are many factors in that. So it has not been determined solely by anyone that this is the price and operator should pricey <coughs> Because this pricing, everyone has this concern that pricing is one of the important factors where operators are reluctant to buy more spectrum. But if we see now historically, I have a different viewpoint as well. It is not only the spectrum price, but it is the aggressive strategy of the operators, which normally should be there. Because if we see in 2014, Uphone has renewed its license on the $291 million US price. And that was, and after that, the other operators, they have got the license, uh, got additional spectrum at somewhat $491 plus million. So, whether after even renewing their license on a low price for a spectrum, whether UFON was able to survive in the market. Because after that, UFON has missed the opportunities in 2016 and 2017. And virtually in 2021, UFON has acquired the spectrum with the cost of somewhat $279 million. So my point is, it is not only the spectrum one thing. It is the aggressive strategy. Anyone who got the spectrum at the market price, which was determined by the government at a particular time, at that, all those operators who got that spectrum may it be Zong in 2000 <coughs> or Telinor in 2016 or Jazz in 2017, whosoever got the spectrum, he was able to grab the market position at that time. So, who have missed the board, so he, he couldn't remain into the his survival in the market become diff, uh, difficult. So point is that spectrum is one thing. The actual thing is aggressive strategy of the operator. How they see the Pakistani market. It's 220 million plus market, although R2 is less. But uh, regulator or uh, Ministry of IT, they have very less control on the overall GDP and the economic growth that uh, dollar devaluation is there. So we can only facilitate in terms of provision of spectrum, whenever government desires or the operator desire, and even in the current spectrum, when uh, there was two spectrum auctions there in Pakistan spectrum, so even a small chunk which was offered, so operators were not much interested, even that was only for top up. But in AJK and GB, all operators came and they require spectrum over there. They see future growth over there. And all the four operators, they acquired the spectrum and the price pro rata basis, it was the same price, which was in Pakistan as compared to the population growth, 
ARPU and the remaining all the factors over there. So whosoever required spectrum at any time that was provided. But if it is the choice of the operator, he sees the price, he sees the market, he sees his ARPU, he sees how much growth is there. So all those factors, <coughs> he, this model, so he makes his own choice for that. So as far as government is concerned, in future as well, all the available spectrum would be offered to the operators. The price determination, it would be a transparent process from the local. Even we have recently in a meeting, we have asked the local industry to give their views, comments, what all should be included, what on which the consultant should work so that can facilitate the industry. So that consultant, while formulating the report, he should address all those issues which should facilitate the industry. So spectrum would be made available. It is available. Price determination is through policy directives and it is according to a fair process. So then it is the choice of the operators that whether that price suits them or it doesn't suit them, they have to make their own choice. But if they have aggressive strategy, they want to become the market leader. So definitely they would be investing into the spectrum. But along with that, their network rollout and other things, when they work out on that, they see the dollar fluctuation, so <clears throat> they make choices for acquisition of additional spectrum or otherwise. Thanks. Okay, so basically, um, Amrita, what you're saying is that um, the government has a policy of making the spectrum available as and when required. But it also depends on multiple factors and particularly on the operator's side on what kind of business strategy that they have that they want to take forward and whether that strategy allows for them to acquire more spectrum. Okay, on that uh, note, again, I'm going to move now to Pervez Iftikhar Saab to you because you're an independent consultant sitting here in Pakistan. You're also aware, I mean, you have a view on what the government is also doing, but then you also have a view on what the industry, uh, what the challenges that the industry are facing as well and what are their thought process. So from an industry perspective point of view, can you also comment on this conversation that we have and that got started and then Amitabh has also, you know, stipulated from the government point of view, but as an international, as an independent consultant from an industry point of view, can you shed some light as well on this topic? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, well, actually, there are, as, as we always see, there are two, two points of view. One is that the prices were too high the conditions, the terms and conditions, I'm interested, the commercial terms and conditions were too tough. And uh, that's why the operators uh, uh, did not or do not participate as much as one would like to. The other viewpoint is that the prices uh, are, are according to the international standards uh, determined by international consultants uh, based on the, the factors like uh, population, ARPU and other conditions of the country, economic conditions of the country. Uh, so which one is right, which one is wrong? Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, maybe another discussion for me for, at this point in time. What, what, what concerns me as an independent consultant and as a Pakistani is that in, at the end of the day, we, we the Pakistanis, the, the people uh, living in this country uh, suffer. We suffer because uh, the the uh, the quality of internet is uh, is simply simply pathetic, I must say, except in the in some large cities and that too in some affluent areas of large cities. So uh, if you ask the operators, uh, they blame the the spectrum, and if you ask the government, they they, they blame the operators. Uh, at the end of the day, we get a raw deal. And I think if, uh, if, uh, if it is uh, what Shahzad Saab is saying, uh, it is because of, the, uh, because of the lack of participation by, by, by the operators. Uh, and uh, it is up to the operators whether they like to participate or not. I think it, we, should, we should look at it in, in another way. And the other way is uh, that we Pakistanis should get a good service, should get a, an, an, an international a world class service how to get how to get that whether the operators are interested or not if they are not interested why they are not interested i mean why are operators interested in spectrum in other countries in the region and our country they are not are, are, are they coming from another planet or are they are they doing something else uh, i mean everybody cooks with the water uh, as, as the saying goes so we must uh, we must be able to 
uh, explore and must be able to dig into this, into the reasons why uh, in the last few auctions only one operator has come up. Why there has been, as Amir Sahib very correctly pointed out, there has been no bidding. There has been no bidding, though no war uh, for Spectrum. Why not? Why is it that our, spec, our operators are, are not wanting to have more Spectrum? Why are they not aggressive? They're very aggressive with prices. We, are, we have one of the lowest ARPUs in the world, and because they are so aggressively competing with each other, why are they not aggressive on, uh, on Spectrum? The, the, what, there must be something wrong somewhere, and somehow we have to determine that, not because the operators want it. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, we can have other operators or, or, or another set of operators uh, as what we have now. My concern is why that we do not get a good service. And that problem uh, uh, is, is uh, as, as a technical person, I know it is not fully, but mainly uh, it is due to the lack of spectrum. Of course, it is also lack of fiberization and other things, maybe we come to that later, but it is, it is the, uh, the spectrum uh, shortage is one of the biggest uh, uh, reasons. And it is very clear that spectrum is, in Pakistan is extremely short is very, when you compare with, uh, with, with the countries uh, all over, uh, especially in the region. So why is that so? And how can we solve that problem? That should be our concern. Uh, and and it, we should not, I, I, I disagree with Amir Saab when he says it is up to the operators. No, sir, it should not be up to the operators. We have to sort that problem out because we, the country and the nation suffers at the end of the day. I'll stop here. You, you've made a very valid point, Pravesa, that we need to determine what are the causes that uh, you know the, the, the industry and the regulator and the government are not on the same page as well, because it needs to be determined. We need to find out if uh, you know the government has offered spectrum, but the operators have not come forward and taken it. So what are the reasons for that? And you're absolutely right. It needs to be done for the betterment of the country, for the betterment of these people. And as Scott mentioned, that we are... Uh, COVID has moved everybody towards a digital economy, and if we need to succeed, and if we need to really be uh, move forward and compete with the rest of the countries, we need to have the right kind of uh, technology infrastructure in place. And both sides, both two sides, three sides, whatever sides that there are, all of them need to come together on the table to determine what's the actual problem and solve it together so that it ultimately benefits Pakistan. So you're right on that point as well, that I think it needs to be determined in that point of view that as to why the industry is not able to take up the spectrum that the government is offering or has been offering for the past few years. Louis, I'm gonna to move towards you now. You're sitting in GSMA, you have a bird's eye view on what's happening around the world. Um, it's my understanding we have either more than uh, um, 100 operators or 100 countries which have already launched 5G in the past two years. So from, uh, and you have a view on what's happening in the other markets as well and what has worked and what hasn't worked. And this is particularly from a 5G spectrum policy, yes. regulatory policy point of view as well. So can you share with us uh, from a GSMA, um, what are the other things that the other policy regulators are doing for 5G in particular and what has worked and even things that has not work uh, in the past two years because of course it's still a learning curve for everyone around the world on 5g it's a new technology it requires a harmonized spectrum all in the you know the low mid and high band as well so everybody is on a learning curve here so it's always good to get these learning so do you have any uh, insights to share with us of course now first of all thank you so much again for the opportunity i think they are um great points to have in mind whenever it comes to what has worked and what hasn't worked around the world. Of course, 5G is not in its 12th year like we are in other technologies. So we're talking about understanding what worked for the first years of the birth of this new technology. So I think it has been mentioned by everybody, but it's good to, to remind about what has worked around the world. And I think that's a great question when it comes to it. So the first one will be on amount of spectrum. As we talked about it here, uh, and I think Scott mentioned, the amount of spectrum in every country is the exact same. So what made the difference whenever it came to the quality of service, uh, availability, and what 5G could bring in different countries that now have the technology 
the first one was the amount of an amount of spectrum. Uh, in those countries, there is no uh, doubt that 700, 2.2, 2.3, 2.6, 3.5, uh, they are available in, in Pakistan, have been uh, assigned. So, but it's not just about the amount of spectrum. So from the GSMA, working on amount of spectrum, we're trying to look into spectrum needs. So uh, we just did a work on mid-bands and we, uh, with Colero Consulting, and we, we, we understood and we, we finalized understanding that two gigahertz of spectrum into mid, mid-bands would be needed. Uh, and the GSMA started saying that the first movement should be 100, uh, 80 to 100 megahertz per operator. So we're seeing that it's not just the amount of spectrum is needed, but it will grow throughout the years. Um, but it's also about how that spectrum is made available, such as if it's available and clean, if it's there to be used immediately, and also if it's contiguous. So if we compare 50 plus 50 or 100, you're already losing uh, 15 to 20% of capacity. And you can even use 90% more energy to make sure that you, you will be able to do the same things with a network that is not using contiguous spectrum. So that's, that's an important mention to see that little chunks of spectrum will not be as good as the availability of spectrum throughout contiguous blocks. Um, so, and the amount of spectrum has made a huge difference, for example, in Saudi Arabia that has the fastest 5G around the world and has been growing more and more every day, making more and more spectrum available for the prices that make sense for that specific country. So this is one point. The second one, I'm not gonna extend myself so we can, we can talk about different topics later, but I'd like to talk about pricing because that's what was mentioned, uh, mentioned by, by the other panelists that is really important whenever it comes to spectrum. Whenever pricing was too high and, and operators were too eager to get that spectrum in countries in Europe, for example, such as Italy, that didn't work as well as in countries where prices were lower. So high reserve prices and the work that the GSMA and the GSMA intelligence has been doing around the world has shown that high reserve prices are directly linked to lower ability to invest. So one, and also whenever it comes to Pakistan more closely, we can see the high reserve prices have a direct uh, relationship into operators not having interest or having spectrum unsold. Mm -hmm. So high reserve prices, and we understand that sometimes we, we look into the right market price uh, and, 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 and different governments look into making sure that the price is correct based on uh, benchmarking or any other ways of making pro a spectrum <laughs> price uh, uh, an analyze and put forward. But we, we always, sometimes we forget that reserve pricing is there to encourage price discovery in that market. So looking into a price that is already the market price and put forward, sometimes it's it doesn't show the right price that operators would like to see and then participate. But the conditions around that spectrum also make the difference. So pricing has been seen around the world as one of the biggest uh, uh, incentives for 5G. We've seen uh, um, New Zealand going for administrative assignment instead of an auction whenever it came to the issues with COVID-19. We've seen lots of things around the world, such as Brazil, discounting a huge price, uh, a huge part of the obligations through, through pricing in every single uh, real that is their money uh, that was over the reserve price will be used in investments. So there are millions of ways of making sure that pricing sets a balance. And we've seen around the world that it made the difference whenever, whenever it came to the amount of spectrum operators had and the results afterward when it, when it came to quality. So I'll, st I'll stop here uh, and then we can, we can develop other topics in, in it throughout, throughout the conversation we're having today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I see you're here with us now. And uh, we started a conversation already, and we were basically talking about the, the World Bank report that Scott did last year on uh, the specifically starting point is the spectrum and the 5G readiness and what are the gaps that are there and what's needed for Pakistan to move in that direction. So I've already had uh, the other panelists 
comment on it as well since now you've come on board as well so would you like to say something on that uh, because i believe you're familiar with that report and you know that what are the findings that came through and the recommendations that uh, scott and the world bank gave uh, in that report uh, thank you atifa like uh, we have gone comprehensively with the world bank specifically with scott uh, in details and the industry with the each and every stakeholders for consultation before putting the report forward uh, the report is quite neutral like it has the pros and the cons has the positive and the negative both so we have to look into the report in a holistic way because there are certain pointer identification in the verticals that can hinder the launch of uh, 5g networks in pakistan so multiple things were clearly mentioned like these uh, show stoppers or bottlenecks can uh, have consequences if not addressed properly by the government uh, so i'll appreciate scott and the world bank for the report uh, and uh, there are multiple uh, angles and dimensions they have mentioned uh, moving forward like as mr lewis was uh, pointing out like uh, the spectrum pricing and the mechanism for different countries that uh, we have seen they have gone for the spectrum auction recently south uh, africa plus usa and certain other uh, south asian countries uh, the point is like uh, the rationalization of the pricing mechanism uh, which shall be dynamic that is based on you know the uh, world bank study plus the input from the industry that is one important point uh, to have a sales based economic model instead of uh, looking at a spectrum as monetization for the government uh, so there are multiple approaches uh, we going to look for after this report the consultancy with the cmos and the stakeholders were uh, conducted now there shall be a second round of consultancy with each and every stakeholders to have their feedback uh, before a policy directive is issued yeah. so a dynamic model uh, shall be adoptable and more uh, proportionate to the pakistan uh, overall technological uh, environment uh, for 5g launch yeah. instead of uh, the legacy model that was previously followed in the last 4 uh, 5 spectrums uh, um, i'll put few uh, words further that uh, not only the spectrum pricing is uh, an a vertical there are certain other verticals uh, which are important uh, once we talk about the 5g technology launch in pakistan i am not specifically pointing about this 5g spectrum allocation or release in pakistan uh, once we talk about the technology launch uh, there are multiple verticals that also needs to be addressed uh, and how we can attract and make a investment friendly and sales based model so the spectrum can be released uh, uh, as per the demand of the market and to make it more attractive we can make it uh, uh, dynamic in terms of uh, verticals that are the duration of the uh, license in terms of the upfront payment in front uh, means there are multiple ways we can do that uh, so these models will also be discussed with the stakeholders to make it uh, all inclusive the purpose for this uh, you know um, a discussion uh, with all the stakeholders is uh, to have an all inclusive approach to have a win win situation for the industry as well as for the users consumers and the government as well so these three will be blended together and this spectrum auction uh i'm sure like it will be far different from the auctions being conducted in pakistan previously thank you mr sir it's heartening to see that you planning to keep uh, to bring everybody on board and to see you know the industry the consumers and the government to come up with a much better and robust policy for 5g going forward you were mentioning something about the verticals can you elaborate a little bit on that because i didn't understand which verticals were, were you specifically referring to once we talk about verticals and the 5g technology it means like uh, spectrum is one vertical then we have the device segment and the user equipment segment that is the second vertical 
Then we have, you know, the optic fiber connectivity to the sides. That's a separate vertical. Then we have, you know, the user basically per capita income. That is another vertical as well. Then we have, you know, the market appetite for the 5G technology. That's the fifth vertical. Then we talk about, you know, uh, the international, you know, uh, players that are going to be interested. That's a separate vertical. Then there are more than 20 verticals I can straight away mention like over here, if you go into the details. So <laughs> there are multiple dimensions we have to look into that. Uh, okay, no, no, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, thank you for clarifying that. So basically what it tells us is that you're looking at it from an overall holistic point of view and not just from a very narrow lens. So I appreciate that. And I'm just going to touch on one vertical very quickly. And the reason I'm doing that is because it's related with transmission and it's very important uh, from a 5G technology point of view as well. Um, but as you know, that in Pakistan, uh, less than 10% of the towers are on fiber optics at the moment, right? So how are you trying to, is, is there a specific, I don't know, steps you guys are taking from a policy point of view, from uh, any other strategy point of view in order to see how can we have more fiber in the country from a transmission point of view so that the latest uh, technology can be more up to speed, uh, if I'm correct in saying that. Uh, at the moment, uh, as we speak today, like uh, we have a deployment of 125,000 kilometers of fiber currently being uh, in place in Pakistan. And the penetration for fiber in terms of uh, tower or BTS or G node B connectivity is 10% uh, approximately. So uh, we just uh, opened a regime for LDI. Uh, PT are issuing the license for that, uh, has fiber obligation as well. On the top of that, uh, uh, for fiberization, uh, in the broadband policy, we have recently discussed two, three weeks back with all the stakeholders that uh, uh, we are opening a regime for neutral tower core regime in Pakistan, uh, where it will be a mandatory clause like these fiber companies uh, and the infra companies, uh, they shall be connecting all the towers. And we are also in discussion for first right of refusal as well for neutral tower core companies uh, and the number of licenses to be in place. Uh, so this is a long pending problem, but uh, the solution which we have uh, uh, mentioned, it's not something new like uh, most of the world has already deployed that. They have the same neutral tower core regime. So that is coming in the national broadband policy under consultation with the industry as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, I'm now going to move uh, from, I'm going to shift from the spectrum uh, point of view to, because we, we need to talk about 5G. So I want to now talk about what's the, uh, well, the killer application would be a very small word to describe the, the impact of a technology such as 5G, but what are the different use cases that are coming forward on 5G uh, from other parts of the world? Because I personally believe, yes, uh, you know, you get ultra low latency and you get enhanced mobile broadband from a consumer point of view, but the actual application of 5G, in my opinion, is in the enterprise space. It's in the public sector space as well. So I'm going to first of all ask Scott, what are you seeing? You're sitting in Australia. Australia has had 5G for two years now. You, you have got other countries in the region as well. So what are the things that are coming forward? It's very new 5G, it's just two years old. Uh, as I've said before, people are still on a learning curve, but what are the things that uh, that's coming forward uh, from a 5G use cases point of view? And the reason I'm asking that is because, see, Pakistan needs to have a starting point as well uh, from a business uh, point of view. You know, you get, you, get all the, you get all the building blocks right, you know, the spectrum is in place, the fiber is in place, but of course it needs to have a business strategy around it as well, which usually the operators focus on. So from a use cases point of view, what's that you looking at at your part of the world? And then after that, of course, I'm gonna to move to Lewis and ask him from a GSMA point of view what he sees in other countries. Sure, thank you very much. And look, you know, the first thing I would say, I think there's now about three to 4 million um, 5G subscribers in Australia. So I don't think it's that new. It's, it's, it's really taking, taking up as a very fast technology. Look, I think the first thing is that the original ITU model had these three use cases um, about um, 
low latency, about high speed internet and about um, always on capability. I think there's a fourth one that's now added to it and it's certainly covered off in our 5G readiness report and that's fixed wireless access. And um, for, a, um, for a country like Pakistan, the ability to, to effectively create um, additional fixed, you know, fixed traditional fixed competition um, using the spectrum is, is really, really important. So I, I think they're the four um, you know, key sort of drivers. Um, the enterprise space I think is interesting. We haven't yet seen in Asia, at least compared with say Europe and North America, the take up of enterprise for 5G. We are seeing it a little bit in Australian mining and resources areas. But I think the bigger challenge you're going to have in Pakistan and across Asia actually, is that there's not the depth of technical experience that doesn't reside in either the telcos or in the vendors. And so that's a, a really interesting debate as to whether Spectrum should be, um, you know, if it's very scarce, I think it should go to the public operators first um, because I think they're going to get maximum use from it for the economy and then look at maybe some additional Spectrum in the areas that you mentioned around enterprises and things like that. Um, but I think at first instance, we go for the public policy, which is you, you then get a shared infrastructure um, and a shared use. I just want to make one other comment, and, and, and I think this is really important. When we allocate, well, when the government allocates spectrum, it should be technology neutral. And I think that's really important. And so what you might see is initially the spectrum being used for 4G. And then it will, over time, with the devices being picked up, um, or the device penetration increasing, or the use cases changing, then it might move to being provided um, 5G on that spectrum. And I think that's really important as part of this readiness journey that Pakistan is on, that you get better services now for 4G, and then that will also start encouraging a whole range of different use cases, entrepreneurs, uh, other, other uh, entities to enter the market, and to take advantage of this new 4G, 5G technology. And I think that's really important so that you get, um, it's not just a matter of importing what everyone else has done. It's, you know, you're doing things that help out agriculture. You're doing things that are, that are Pakistani specific as part of that, that process. And I think that's really important. Yeah, Lila's point over there. Uh, Louis, your thoughts on this? You're on mute. <laughs> mute. Apologies, I'm on mute. So mm -hmm. I I will repeat some things as well that that Scott has 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 put forward, uh, but I think that's 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 good to add some some things there. Yeah, we, we know that 5G is about speed, low latency, mobility, things that we haven't seen as good as in other tech in other technologies before. So that creates exactly this kind of perfect scenario for new use cases. Uh, but one point to mention is that the first movement of 5G has been directly with the user moving from 4G to 5G. And that, that has been what we've seen throughout the world because that is the first uh, uh, approach that generally comes with a technology. That's what we're used to. Uh, and, 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 and it has mentioned uh, by, by Scott, that is, uh, a learning curve about how to approach for other use cases, but they have been appearing around the world. So uh, that, is, that is related to education, healthcare, manufacturing, especially manufacturing, and also agriculture. So those are common ones that we've seen before in 4G and that have been growing and, may, and being better, even better in 5G. So those use cases uh, that we, um, we see and they are related to vertical industries that's uh, or enterprises as, as 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 you both mentioned they have to be really thought through whenever we think about uh, the spectrum resources and i think that's important to mention because if we think about uh, spectrum resources as they are now and we make sure that it's available to other players other than the mobile net mobile operators that have the knowledge the expertise and know how to actually handle spectrum and have have known throughout the years how to handle spectrum we're creating a, a an issue of 
risks of making sure that Spectrum is made available to other players that may not use Spectrum the same way. And while we do and keep it as through the mobile operators, those vertical industries will be able to lease and share and that's what we've seen, for example, in Finland, whenever the, the discussion has started there and operators were actually able to provide to more than one vertical at the same time, especially as you think about verticals, you think about localized usage with uh, an amount of spectrum for a specific geography, operators were able to do more than once. And if you actually use uh, uh, another approach that would be harder to actually handle and, uh, and, and manage that spectrum and it would not be used as much as if an operator had it. So the, the final agreement was that operators would lease uh, a spectrum to uh, vertical industries and those agreements would be part of their licensing uh, terms. So that was a way of finding uh, a way forward there. So that's a good example we, thought, we saw around the world. The United States lease a lot to uh, different players and that thinks it is the biggest example around the world. And whenever it comes to what has happened in Europe, we haven't seen the take up yet whenever it comes to spectrum being used by verticals. But the, ex the, the expectation, and the GSMA has been working with lots of socioeconomic benefit reports. We did millimeter wave, we're now finalizing socioeconomic benefits for mid bands and we'll do low bands as well. Uh, especially on, on high bands and mid bands, you, you see that big use cases are the ones that drive the highest socioeconomic benefits. But it depends on the spectrum being available, more spectrum being available, and the right management structure to be in place in order for this to be developed more and more, because we are in a learning curve, and this will happen soon, and not and, and it has been happening, but it will grow even more. Okay, um, so Omar Saab, just to carry this conversation forward, as uh, Louise and Scott both mentioned that, um, you know, a, a lot of operators in other countries are looking into the possibility of leasing out the spectrum to other vertical players, especially on the industrial and the enterprise side as well. So now that you guys are working on the, you know, the 5G strategy and the policy and the paperwork and the way forward, is this an area that the government is actually looking at right now in, the, in Pakistan or are you primarily as a starting point just focusing on the consumer aspect and providing it to the, to the operators only? Uh, the question that uh, Louis mentioned is very critical and uh, the solutions are available as well. I'll give one example that uh, specifically in the Middle East, uh, wherever there is a 3G, 4G service available, and once they launch 5G, so it's a matter of provisioning. Let's say in Pakistan, like we have a 5% device penetration of 5G at the moment. Uh, so it's a simple provisioning uh, issue that needs to be addressed uh, during the strategic plan by the CMOs. So it's not only the user-oriented stuff, but uh, from the CMOS angle, like the provisioning is one of the important factor that uh, subscribers, those are high end, those are premium subscribers can be immediately shifted to 5G. And it's uh, just like a simple provisioning mechanism that can be implemented. Uh, so in Pakistan, like, uh, yes, we, we have uh, already studied and uh, gone into details for uh, this particular vertical. There are other mechanisms as well, not only the provisioning 4G, 5G interoperability, but uh, the other cases are also there as per our environment. Uh, like in Europe uh, and in US, uh, the entire ecosystem is a bit different. Uh, so we cannot uh, just uh, replicate the same over here. We have to look into our you know, constraints and the dimensions and the factors which we are facing to introduce that. Um, um, I hope that uh, going to answer your question. Um, uh, no, that's fine, uh, Musa, because what I specifically wanted to uh, you know, comment on, but it's okay, I understand that it's still, as you guys have said, it's still in the beginning stages as well. Because what Louis mentioned was specifically the, you know, the leasing of the spectrum by the operators to some of the verticals in the industries if they want to roll out, have their own private, you know, networks and have different use cases that they want to, uh, 
use cases that they want to try out, but that's fine as well. Um, but Ms. Iftikhar said, I would like to now move towards you and you know take your view again from an industry and the consumer point of view as well, that um, do you feel that there is an appetite for uh, 5G in Pakistan from a consumer point of view and from the operator's point of view at this point in time? Yeah, okay, thank you. Probably not. Uh, there, uh, it, it is no visible uh, appetite, but uh, there was no visible appetite for 3G also. Uh, and then came all of a sudden uh, these new applications and 4G similarly. Uh, and now we have so many businesses running uh, just because of 3G and 4G, these, uh, these, these Ubers and Kareems and Food Pandas and all that, and, and it, employing thousands, literally thousands of people uh, just because we have this 3G and 4G running, so uh, one has to be one has to be proactive. Uh, there will be certainly use cases uh, which are which are suitable for us. There are use cases even today, but some of them are only for the for the developed world. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. But uh, for that, I think what we need to do is we need to uh, we need to have more and uh, widespread. 5G trials by by the operators. The operators should uh, should be asked to should be made to um, made to sort of create uh, uh, islands in in universities, for example, in incubation centers, for example, very small islands where where they can have where people can have 5G and and test use cases on them. Uh, I I can tell you our our youth is very enterprising. They come up with brilliant ideas the startups which are coming up they sometimes when i go to nic and other places i'm quite amazed to see how uh, forward they are thinking uh, if they are uh, uh, provided uh, uh, opportunities to try out 5g uh, i'm sure they can come up with uh, with fantastic use cases also uh, there have been trials of course uh, in the past uh, by by all the uh, cmos but they were more to test their own capabilities and to test their own uh, whether the 5G uh, will will run or not, or whether they can manage it or not, not for use cases. So for use cases, we have to uh, we have to uh, give opportunities to uh, to our youth, to our uh, engineering uh, graduates, to UETs, where people can uh, can 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 use can you know play with the with the with the 5G. Uh, and, and, and come up with use cases. And I think uh, apart from the use cases that, that we can import from outside, uh, we certainly have a lot which can be done by us, ourselves for us. Uh, in fact, we can then uh, let others use them too. And uh, to, to, to expect that there will be a, a demand or an appetite for a, for a technology which is very new, which is which we haven't seen, which we haven't touched, which we haven't felt, uh, that will be too much. But uh, uh, it has been proven in some countries, and uh, it has been proven by the previous 3G, 4G experience that there will be a lot uh, of use cases which will come up once we let our people uh, try it, use it, and touch it and feel it. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you on that, Professor. We have a we have a huge talent in this country, and I have I'm a great believer of, you know, the things that the Pakistani youth can come up with. Omar Sahib, you've got your hand raised. So, would you like to uh, further comment on this? Ah, uh, yes, I'll completely agree with the Professor for that. Like the inclusion is not only the industry and uh, the government and the users, but uh, from the skill and the user case uh, business development point of view like uh, it's a complete technology uh, environmental development for 5g for that like uh, he mentioned about nic's like yes we are coming up with a plan inshallah within a month time you will see like what exactly going to happen because uh, i am not going to disclose uh, a bit premature but uh, the plan is there it is already materialized and once uh, it is in the deployment phase for test trials and for business case development, uh, inshallah, within a month time, you will hear this news uh, all over the Pakistan. 
So we are aggressively working on it, uh, Parvez sir, and uh, that point is uh, very much uh, critical for us as well. So are we looking forward to that good news then, Umar? Hopefully soon, inshallah. Ahmed sir, you've got your hand raised as well, so you'd like to add on something? Yeah, sure. There are a few points which I wanted to add on. Uh, first of all, when we see the use cases, so currently, as a reg from regulator perspective and from the current auction, we are trying to improve the 4G connectivity at Pervesab as mentioned in the start as well, that first of all, what we did is we enhanced from 2 Mbps to 4 Mbps. So at least bare minimum, it should be 4 Mbps. Because when people start feeling the power of device in their hand, then they look for better devices. So for EMBB application even, so if they have better connectivity in first hand, then they would look for that. Now, the second thing is spectrum was one aspect which operator should have. The second important thing was backhaul connectivity. At the moment, I'm getting reports, complaints, and we when we analyze it, operator have sufficient BTSs in that area, spectrum is there, but the backhaul connectivity to those BTSs was so less, and they have not enhanced it. I have uh, cases in my hand in Lahore, in urban areas where their backhaul connectivity was so poor that even with the spectrum and with the latest, uh, what all techniques they implied, still they couldn't give the better quality of service. So we are focusing on that, that they should improve their backhaul connectivity for that. Fibrization was one of the important aspects, as Umar Sahib has mentioned. What we did is that we have started building this fibrization at part of our licensing regime. Currently, we have opened up our LDI licenses, and in that, we have given an obligation that in next six years, all LDI operators will have backhaul and long-haul fiber connectivity, even, even they gave it to the towers that would be acceptable. So 1,500 kilometers fiber would be laid by all operators. And people are coming to us. We have received in one week four applications. They are ready to invest in. So we, one, leaving it on the market and one, a bit of market intervention. And we are trying to improve the fibrization. Because if you see the Chinese model or any other country who have the maximum subscriber, fibrization played a very key role in that. The third thing is we have seeing the use cases at the moment we are getting different iot applications which can be linked with the 5g networks within these cities and we are going to issue an iot framework in a week or two weeks time it has been finalized frequencies have been identified ranges have been and there would be very less a licensing requirement in that and mostly it would be the type approved a standard system if device falls in a particular category of power rating, he don't need a license even. He just have to get a type. So we are trying to facilitate because if, uh, like I have uh, got the use cases in weather domain, in agriculture, leveling of the lands, and certain other cases where people want to deploy IoT. So we are, uh, except this idea, maybe we are looking for those. So we are trying to facilitate within our frameworks that people should not be put into cumbersome licensing process if that falls and fair frequency allocation board has already allocated us that below these power ratings PTA can look into it whether license is required and we are uh, this uh, not putting the, those IoT applications or that equipment into our licensing framework so that people should be facilitated. So uh, taking lead from all this we are trying to build an environment where people should have the touch where they should feel that they need to put in into this domain so they have the idea that how speed with better speed with better connectivity with fibrization they get better speed and with small iot applications so they start building the networks and automatically it would lead towards the 5g applications or the use cases the another thing which we are seeing, we are not purely, because we have not finalized the terms of reference for our consultant, we are not purely looking at only cellular mobile operators. It may come but in FWA, there may be other operators. They may come up with the only fiber base with the spectrum, although WLL previous regime has didn't pay much and it virtually led to the closure, but we need to build those cases now with protect those operators if they are going for FWA or such application, we should not 
leave it on only on the uh, this mobile operators that do should be looking for 5g so we are looking for uh, we are looking in various dimension where fwa can have a better application as as umar saab mentioned in middle east it is one of the prime application over there so how we build over this complete mosaic how this picture would be come it would be after few months we are working in close collaboration with the industry with the ministry of it is taking a lead role and so this time hopefully we will address all the queries and the issues to have better use cases for pakistan great so what you're saying is basically we'll have a clearer picture in a few months as well and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see a clear way forward um i just have a last question and i want to ask all of you um, and just comment on that but before that i would like to request any if any of the audiences have any questions please feel free to type it in into the q and a box and we will address those questions as well if not then i'll just uh, i'm going to move on to the last question and we'll see if we have any questions coming in um i see aslam hayat saab has joined us aslam do you have a question can aslam uh, ask us directly yes she can yeah uh, i was uh, a great session i'm really grateful uh, wonderful discussion i really do not have an answer a uh, question because uh, most of the issues which were in my mind have been addressed adequately uh, what is extremely important is that uh, whatever policy or the framework pta and the ministry come up with they need to address the burning issues in the industry because we have seen uh that the industry especially the operators uh, they have not uh, really maturely handled many things and that's where uh, the intervention is required so i'm pretty sure that uh, the ministry and pta would like to make sure that uh, the customers the end users they get the best quality at an affordable price that should be the key objective of everything every policy thank you and thank you for that comment and if anybody else has any other questions you can ask them directly or type them into the q and a box and then i'll just move on ji mudassar hussain sahab i see you raised your hand please feel free to ask your question yeah assalam alaikum uh, thank you very engaging talk uh, i hope you can hear me can you yes loud and clear <laughs> <laughs> okay so we we have a very good set of experts and uh, scott and luis and pervez up uh tight upon all aspects but the key thing remains what pervez referred to so we need to see well that everybody in the world knows that there's less spectrum and this and that and you know there's a lot to be improved why are the operators whose sole business is providing cellular communications they are not coming forward so that remains the key point uh and asma mayad saab just just mentioned that we need to address those issues we come up with a transaction we come up with a new plan but we don't address what is already plaguing the industry so you move on to a new step without and and the basic basic issue is that investment has to be planned for 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 a new initiative like this so what is the basis of operators to plan their investments into the spectrum auction to luis made a very good point about the leasing spectrum what i with lease i would suppose is that Uh, try it out for free for a little while where where people develop the use cases and operators get a hang and feel of it uh, but that's that's one area that that could be looked at but the key issue is that with a 1 dollar arpu 1.14 to be exact with the current devaluation with the 4g threshold still to be with 50% devices still on 2g with 10% towers on uh on the fiber these are all the issues that must be addressed that will make the market ready and scott's been saying it over and over again that these are all the issues to be taken together so uh, one key question is that the government may want, want for socio political reasons a 5g leap of faith but do we want a 5g service or do we want to sell the spectrum for 5g so what's in mind this should be absolutely clear if you want 5g then you need to make it happen if it's in jazz's business case if it's not in my 
business plan till 2026. Give me something that brings it back to 2023. So that is the key issue that you, you, you make people comfortable. And that's a comment for the regulator, for everybody to think of how can we break this, whether we want the service for the people or we want the money from the spectrum. That's the whole issue. Thank you. Thank you, Madhusa, for that very burning comment. Um, Umar, you. you've got your hand raised. So you want to comment on that? Uh, yes, like uh, the reservations for that are very much uh, clear. And those has been put in writing and in details uh, by the CMOs to us as well. Uh, the basic uh, cause for 5G technological development in Pakistan is the socioeconomic development in the country. So that is pretty much clear to all stakeholders, even to the government. It's uh, basically not for monetization purpose. So if there is a perception that spectrum auction is only for uh, monetization of the dollar value from the CMOs, so that is uh, not the case because uh, uh, it's very specifically and clearly uh, depicted and uh, communicated to all the stakeholders in the government, like uh, the prime reason is the socio-economic development. Uh, also, uh, Mudassar Saab pointed a uh, few other stuff, but uh, he only hinted that, like, what are the obstacles? He has not specifically mentioned that. The dollar value denomination and the depreci uh, depreciation of rupee. So no worries, like these points were already taken from the industry that uh, what shall be the best way forward uh, for the pricing of the spectrum, basically, either it's a US uh, dollar denominated or whatever the case may be. So it shall be decided in consultation with the federal cabinet and the government, including PT and FAB all together. So these points we have already taken seriously and have taken note of it uh, in the consultation uh, once we were uh, in discussion with the Scott as well and with the World Bank's uh, stakeholders for the readiness plan. We just wanted to uh, brief that. Uh, okay. Uh, Scott, you've got your hand raised as well. You want to follow up with a comment? Yeah, absolutely. And look, you know, I think this is really getting a really good discussion because um, part of our report was very much focused in about how do we do the right things to get people to invest? And, and that's really the challenge. And, you know, I, you know, I sit on the board of two Australian listed companies and the number one issue, and I've presented to many boards of, of telcos around the world. The first thing you're going to say is where's the spectrum, right? Can we get access to spectrum? If we're going to invest in a new technology, whether it's 4G or 5G, you know, what sort of services can we offer? What have we paid to, to effectively into the market? And, you know, it's really pleasing that through the interaction that we've had, um, we, we, I think we're going to see some change. And I think that um, if you look back at the last two auctions, not the, um, the smaller one, but the other two, they haven't worked. So you've got to do something different. You want to win a test match, you've got to play a different strategy, right? And I think that's really important. Um, that you've got to do something different. Otherwise, you, you know, you'll repeat those same, you know, errors again. And, and I think part of that is about making spectrum available. It's encouraging the operators in Pakistan to be able to, um, you know, ask the right questions of, of their shareholders to effectively invest. You know, government can only play a certain amount of role, actually. It, 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 the levers are not, you know... A, you know, government doesn't do operations well in the telco space. Um, and it can facilitate and it can do all the right things. It can remove all those um, speed speed bumps and roadblocks. And that's really what, I, what I'm pleased that I'm hearing and I've heard over the last 12 months that that's starting to happen. But, you know, the key thing here is some vision. The key thing here is, is to say we really need, an, you know, an objective Right, that you know, and, and I think the paper that we tried to articulate says that that you know where you are now in terms of spectrum, we want to have 840 or 960 in total megahertz allocated in this market in a short period of time. If you have a target, you tend to then drive towards it, right? And I think that's really important, and hopefully that gets picked up in the policy because um, you know because how do you measure yourself, 
oh, we did a little bit better. Well, that's it, not enough. You know, where Pakistan is at, you've got a great opportunity, you know, great entrepreneurial, you know, people who are, who are probably in many cases say, well, if I can't make my idea work in Pakistan, I'm going to head to the US or head somewhere else. And, and that's a shame. And, you know, you've got to create the right environment that they'll start building national economic wealth. And part of that national economic wealth is about connectivity. And um, so uh, I don't want to harp on it too much, but I think that, um, you know, that's really, really important. And so pricing, all, all those other things really do need to be part of the discussion and, and work out um, what are the key real difficulties on, on having a world comparable service in, in Karachi, in Islamabad and in Lahore. Lewis, I'm going to go on to you because you've got your hand raised. And then I think, I believe we've got another question from Zulfikar Sahib. But first, I'm going to ask Lewis to comment. I think he wants to comment on the present conversation that we're having. Yes, yes. It will be a, a pretty quick comment, actually. It's just to um, uh, talk a little bit about 4G whenever we're talking about 5G, because I think that's what uh, I think that's what Jazz brought as well, because uh, we know the 4g penetration going into pakistan not just the, the global view about it uh so the 4g penetration in pakistan is 38 percent adoption of of uh all smartphones is 51 percent as 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 we get from the gsma uh database um and the expectation is that 5g will be around three to five percent in 2025 so what we've seen and then going back global what we've seen around the world is that tackling the needs of 4G is still 100% needed because 4G and 5G will coexist throughout this and the next decades. Uh, so we're not only talking about everything will be 5G from, 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 from night to day, from day to night. We're talking about uh, the, the capabilities that are still needed for 5G, uh, for 4G have to be thought through. So uh, one big thing that has changed uh, a lot around the world would be whenever it comes to taxation. So taxation was a big burden in lots of countries whenever it came to smartphones as well on the 4G era. And it has changed in Brazil, for example, from one month to another, they moved from 30% to 60% um, uh, um, um, uh, smartphone penetration because of the taxation changes they made for a specific time. It was not even needed for a long, long time because you needed people to start moving from one um, simple phone to a smartphone. So those things are necessary. 4G needs to be uh, still incentivized in lots of ways uh, to make sure that, the, that 5G comes in the right state. The GSMA will soon be releasing a uh, APAC roadmap report that does include Pakistan. Uh, and one of the messages is we do need to make sure that 4G is uh, part of uh, a higher amount of people actually having access to it uh, and affordability for 5G as well. And, and, and we understand that this is something uh, going and happening in Pakistan. Uh, and we can think about 5G at the same time, but having 4G in mind, because the amount of spectrum for every technology is needed now. And then we have to think future proof to know when things will happen, when spectrum will be available, when uh, specific uh, terms and conditions will change or will be put forward. So operators can actually plan throughout that time to invest correctly and know what will be the next stage. That, that, that is also important to mention. Yeah, it makes sense because naturally the, the transition has to be from 4G towards 5G. It's not going to be standalone. So we need to get our basics right on 4G, first of all, in order to move forward. That's why. Uh, Zulfika, you've got your hand raised. I know you've typed in your question as well, but it's okay if you can open up your mic and ask your question directly. Zulfikar, are you there? Zulfikar Ali? Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll just read out his question because he's, he's typed it in the Q&A box as well. Uh, do you anticipate Chinese vertical participants equipment wise? And I believe this is something that uh, the two government representatives can comment on. Uh, Omar Malik Saab and Amr Shahzad Saab. Are you expecting the, do you Omar Saab, please go ahead. Um, basically, you know, like uh, there is no, um, Parity in that way, we can say that it's a level playing field for everybody. 
we're not going to create or we are not uh, in a direction to create any uh, vertical that can only support one segment like if you have seen our previous uh, consultations uh, i'll give one example like on 1st of jan ericsson has already invested 31 million us dollars in pakistan for uh, 5g ecosystem development uh, so once we compare it with the, the rest of the companies uh, uh, that's not the case like nokia already went into partnership for providing consultancy and all that uh, uh, ecosystem development uh, with us so till of now we do not have any mou or something like that with the, any of the chinese company for 5g so the question uh, that was put forward and the results on grounds are a bit opposite. Uh, so it's a level playing field for everyone, for all the vendors, manufacturers all over the world. Yeah. Okay, so basically you're open to anybody who can come in and join us. That's fine as well. So I'm going to ask my very leading last question and I just need a, a, a sort of like just a very simple answer from all of you because we just have nine minutes left uh, before we close the session. So I just need a very small answer with a very specific time frame that you guys think is the right one. So my question and a very leading one in at that is that when do you think Pakistan will be ready for 5G? Is it this year, next year, two years, five years down from there? Scott, what's going to be your answer? Uh, look, I think the journey has already started to 5G and uh, by having these types of sessions, by getting a wider audience discussing 5G rather than it just being inside the sector is really important to that. So, um, but until we see the spectrum allocations, um, it's all talk in my mind, um, you know, because the, the spectrum allocations at the moment barely support quality 4G. Um, so until we see some larger contiguous uh, allocations of spectrum, you know, we, we are having a, um, a theoretical discussion. So um, hopefully that's 2022, hopefully that's 2023. And then that journey starts. And I just want to say one more thing. If we pick, you know, good bands that can support both 4G and 5G, like 2.3, like 700, uh, like 2.6, then you have an opportunity to really accelerate that journey rather than um, just trying to jump completely directly into 5G in a pure, in a pure way. So thank you. Okay. Louis, over to you. It's not an easy one to respond, of course, but the GSMA expects that uh, 3 to 5% of connections in Pakistan will be 5G in 2025. So that requires the planning to start now and it to happen full in two years or so. Um, so that's something we don't have a, uh, an idea what's the best way forward and when it will happen. But our expectation is three to five percent in 2025, and uh, that requires everything that we talked about today. So the future planning, roadmap planning, know when things will be available so operators can actually plan through all that time, and we're thinking about pricing, availability, taxation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that's a important conversation to have with the industry to understand when they are also ready to move forward. But I have to agree, 5G has started in Pakistan. We are talking about it now, and that has been something we've been doing for some time and talking about it to plan. So uh, the expectation is is really positive for sure. Parvesa, uh, so Umar I'm going to come to you at last. <laughs> uh, G Parvesa, what, what, what do you think? When will Pakistan be ready for 5G or C5G? <laughs> Well, uh, it's a it's a it's a typical answer, uh, which which is it depends, you know, uh, it depends on a lot on how how things move, uh, how uh, the government moves, how how quickly PTA moves. Uh, there are lots of things to be done, as we just discussed in the last uh, uh, hour plus. Uh, what we haven't discussed, perhaps, is uh, is the speed with which they need to be done. I mean, uh, speed has been uh, a major uh, um, element uh, in, in, in whatever has happened so far. Uh, we, uh, given the given circumstances and the given conditions and the rules and regulations that we followed, so things take time. But uh, let me just quote an example of IoT. Uh, Amir Saab just mentioned that IoT, IoT framework will be there in a week or two. I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I, we thought it was it was ready six months ago, 
and we said we will wait for the auction and then we will release it so uh, speed is uh, one thing which with which we uh, have not uh, moved as much as we one would like to but um, if we if we move with speed in my opinion it can be done in 2023 2023 i mean middle of 2023 okay that, that that's optimistic ji amit is also so you're on mute aap mute pe <laughs> okay sorry uh, i would say only this thing that we are trying to make the platform available we are trying to give the ground and would leave it on to the market forces and uh, we are making an effort and umar sahab is aware of that that by 2023 at least we should provide that ground or platform so that government of pakistan should take a decision that when exactly it is too large and we are working on it in collaboration with the industry with the government so we are trying to make it by early 2023 we should provide that platform and then it depends on the government and the industry and the market forces that whether they are ready for 5g launch and still we need more time ji umar sahab last but certainly not the least i wanted to keep you for the last deliberately please give us your answer my question can be the other way around like why pakistan should not launch 5g timely like uh, the example quoted previously as well like uh, in 3g 4g we had made a mistake a lapse of uh, 10 years all the world launched the 3g uh, in 2005 and 6 so there is no question about it like uh, we should not launch 5g timely if we do not do that then after 5 to 10 years again we have to go into the same repercussions of uh, digital and digitalization and digital pakistan stuff like we're going to lag behind a lot and we're going to miss the second wave that is going on and then it will be beyond the control of everybody so launching 5g is not only the 5g uh, mobile phone uh, connectivity with the 5g technology it's a, a complete uh, technological ecosystem launch development research and development in pakistan including as uh, parvez sahab mentioned the iot stuff the uh, verticals related to iot's lighthouse networks uh, autonomous uh, networks so it's a complete new era in the environment yeah. so we cannot wait for the future and we have to do the work timely and uh, very specifically over here thank you atifa thanks a lot thank you umar sir that's a very nice thing you said that we cannot wait for the future we need to create our own future thank you gentlemen for joining this session i had a very engaging conversation with all of you um it's absolutely necessary for the betterment of pakistan's economy for the consumers and everything that we move towards latest technologies as soon as possible we've had very open discussion today on what are the gaps that needs to be addressed what are the things that needs to be fixed before we move in that right direction once again gentlemen thank you very much for joining it was a pleasure talking to all of you have a really nice day thank you once again thank you so much and i will log off this session now Thank you. Thank you very much and thank, thank you. you. Thank you as well. Thank, thank you very much everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.